Just punch the button, punch the green bunch, button, punch the purple button, wherever it is, whoever it is. Alfredo Esparza is a genius. He knows the button. So few people know how to punch the button. Greetings. Episode number 52 of Slam and Stam. This is Vandal Drummond, joined by Alfredo Esparza. How you doing tonight, Fredo? Doing pretty good. Where's Dick? I'm so Where is Dick? Calling in. I'm so used to him calling in like at the very start of the show. I know. I think we should put a, uh, you know, what what what's the term that the police use uh, when when you want want to you know put a what's the EPA EBI whatever an A-T-B? FYI an A-T-B? APB that's it yes yeah yeah okay. you know how to punch buttons I know how to mess up initials I'm very good at that <laughs> I'm I'm brilliant you know I was listening to the Lucha World show and I was just cracking up every time you screwed up Mondo Lopez name I know I know I would love so much to take that episode. And redo that piece, that one piece. I he Mondo Lopez deserved a much better tribute than I gave him. And now poor Mondo Guerrero thinks someone thinks somewhere. I'm equivocating him with Mondo Lopez. And somewhere someone thinks Mondo Guerrero is dead. Because <laughs> <laughs> you know a lot of people can't tell the last names apart. So you know. that's true. I do hope Mondo Guerrero is not dead. That that would be uh, really sad. Uh, yeah, Mon- Mondo Lopez was more in the jobbing category, although, I, you know, I I should say jobber category as far as wrestling for the LaBelles or Roy Shire or uh, whatever territories he was in. As far as an indie wrestler, he was a little higher in the fray, and deservedly yeah. so. The guy was a good worker and a good teacher and a nice guy to boot. Um Speaking of other workers, I, is Larry, is uh, Ryan Doyle on the line right now? Oh, he's still listening. He's still listening. Still, okay. It's still not his time yet. We have to talk because about because uh, I actually found on YouTube another prolific LA jobber. Uh-huh. I found a match of his on YouTube from 1983. That was on a show that I actually wrestled on, and I was amazed that uh, not only was this jobber on this particular YouTube video, but he went over. We'll we'll talk about it more later when uh, when Ryan signs on. So about, first person we got to talk about Teddy Hart. <laughs> Teddy Hart, Fredo, you must fill us in on the latest Teddy Hart story. And might I say, Appar- did you know the funny thing? Apparently, he told more than one person this story, this idea. Yeah, cause, mm-hmm. cause there were a lot. There are a couple of other people who said that they were told this. It, and Hart. it's been so long since we've had a good Teddy Hart story. So fill us in, Fredo. What's what's the uh, Teddy Hart story well, here? He, I guess he I guess he ran an indie show in um, Canada, and his he he I guess he he told I guess he did a podcast show or something where he they were talking about some of his ideas, and one of his ideas is to train animals to do run-ins, you know, cats and dogs. I don't know. I, if it's, I don't know if it's more than just cats and dogs, but. That's what was mentioned as cats and dogs doing run-ins. And then there's another one of the, his ideas was that he would use ladders, and then the ladders, like, you would call in, you know, like you text when you're voting for, like, American Idol. Yeah. The, like, you could text in, and then you could, like, vote how much higher you want the ladder to go. <laughs> and then the ladder would go, like, three to five feet higher. And I'm like, yeah, you know that that did a, that did wonders for all those guys who did tables, letters, and chairs matches. Yes, exactly. You know, one of them retired because of bad back. The other one's going to rehab. The other one went to rehab and pretty much it's crazy. Yes, and yes. I I mean, talking about the story everybody's heard about Matt Hardy crashing and burning in such a sad way. Yeah. Do we really need higher ladders? No, oh no, no, we don't. But the animal one, the animal one, I just, I just thought that, and oh, and then he said if he, if, if, he, if they can't like bite a, he, he didn't, he wasn't sure if he wanted the animal to bite the referees or the wrestlers. Oh, you have that. Oh, well. But, but wait, but his other idea was maybe they could carry weapons into the, the ring. That <laughs> would rock. Could you, could you imagine a monkey with a kitchen knife? Oh, serious. <laughs> that would be so cool. Imagine, what, you know, oh, it, you'd have to think of something for a dog. I mean, since a dog can't hold a weapon, you'd have to, like... Yeah, hold put it in his mouth. You could put it in his mouth or, or put a helmet on his head with, like, a laser gun. You know what you could do? You could put, like, a little, a little like, blade inside, like, a newspaper. 
and then the doc can bring the newspaper, and people will think, oh, he's bringing a newspaper. Then all of a sudden, he ro- unrolls the newspaper, and a little, like, a fork comes out or something. If somebody told me 24 hours ago that Teddy Hart would come up with something brilliant, I would have said, you're high. Teddy Hart is a nut job. You know, and, and now this. I know, seriously. I love this. Oh, man. This Parakeeto could have his own parrot. Well, see, you, you, could all, you could always just dump the whole idea of having animals and just get midgets to dress them as animals. Yeah, that, that would be, that'd be cool, too. Better yet, better yet, you know how wrestling has, you know, wrestling has for many years thrived on kayfabe, you know, just complete adherence. Wrestling is real. Tell everybody it's real. This would be better. Tell people that the wrestling is fake, but the animals are real when what they actually are are dwarfs in costumes. You know, it'd be kind of funny if you could train a cat. How can you train? I don't think you can train a cat to do something. You know, you'd have to you'd have to step up a notch. You couldn't just take a domestic house cat. Yeah. Um, that really wouldn't be cool. You'd have to have an animal. You know, d- domestic house cats get a little skittish when they're in front of a lot of people. They're really not meant to perform. So I think what you do is get something a little larger, like a, a cougar. That sounds that sounds that sounds like a better idea. Yeah, that would be good. You know, get a cougar and you know find some of the wrestling performers who have done some pretty messed up stuff to people in the past, and you know, get them you know, in the ring and don't declaw the cougar. You know, it's too bad. Do one of those matches where the wrestler says, "I could, I could." beat a wild cougar or uh, a pack of coyotes with one hand tied behind my back and then just watch the animals devour him. <laughs> I, I can think of several people in the business that I would, I would, oh, pay-per-view to see, like, you know, somebody, some really obnoxious prick in the Ooh. business get devoured by a wild animal. Who was the guy, wasn't there a guy here locally who had, like, piranhas or something like that? Oh, I <laughs> believe it was... I believe Fred Olin Ray ran a promotion where they had a like a little tank with piranhas in them, uh-huh. and it, you know I'm, my memory's a little foggy here, but I think they lifted that from uh, a promotion, one of the hardcore promotions in Japan. They had a piranha tank where people stuck each other's head into a tank full of piranhas. See, that's what wrestling needs. We need more of that stuff. We do need uh, stuff like that. In fact, I think uh, Kevin Kleinrock, Kleinrock talked about when he did uh, the um, wrestling show on MTV that yeah. one of the producers had heard about that gimmick and wanted to do it. And he said, yeah, he said something to the effect of, yeah, we can do it, but let's not just pull the tank of piranhas out there. Let's have a story behind it, you know, a story behind building up to it which I think something the hardcore promotions kind of missed out on. They just said, hey, here's these wild piranhas. Let's stick our heads in it, you know? Have you ever wrestled a bear? Have I ever wrestled a bear? Yeah. No, that's one thing I haven't done. I've wrestled under feel, multiple don't like identities. Bit, don't you feel that's like one of those things you should actually add to your... I would actually love to do that. Yeah. Have you ever wrestled anybody bear? <laughs> Yes, I have. No, I mean, that. well, that, well, that's, that. funny, that's a funny question. I, oh, nah, me never. Um, no, but that. it is a, a dream of mine. I mean, um, you know, we could reenact a, a, the scene in that movie Woman in Love where Oliver Reed and Alan Bates wrestle naked in the living room. <laughs> uh, there's just some things that no one should see. That's the... Yes, including Oliver Reed and Alan Bates uh, wrestling each other naked. It was a great film from, I think, 1968, but, you know, I don't mind that scene being cut. I think actually it was around 1970, because I remember my parents going to the movies and not knowing what that was. Oh, no way. And we're, like, really thrown by that. <laughs> <laughs> they like, never recovered. Yeah, I exactly. love that. You know, I told them, you know, they should have gone see the Neil Simon movie instead, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome. <laughs> Well, and speaking of movies coming around, you know, that came out just around that general er- era is I didn't realize it until I was just uh, perusing Amazon.com, but 
the movie that I have raved about, probably on several episodes of Slam and Stan, Skidoo, one of the last films, I believe, by Otto Preminger, and the last film that Groucho Marx ever appeared on, and the only film where you can see Jackie Gleason dropping LSD is now available in commercial release. Yeah, but you're going to have to order that online. You're not going to be able to walk into your regular Walmart or whatever and find that film there. I doubt. Yeah, and that's why I refuse to shop at Walmart, the uptight bastards. <laughs> yeah, it came out... Uh, oh, this is really fitting. Okay, I'm, I'm actually looking at the release date right now. Let me guess. Let's see if I can remember this. Was it 1967? You're very close. 1968. 68, okay. Yeah, it's probably one of the most important films ever made. Um, you know, the the Brotherhood of Eternal Love should have really pushed this movie. Uh, and what's really cool is the DVD release date was July 19th, 2011. Now, July 19th is a very, very important date because... It was on that day in 1992 when Physico Nuclear made his debut at the All Nation Center in Boyle Heights. So I can't help but think Otto Preminger's spirit just kind of channeled and went through Amazon.com and said, you know, there's an alignment here that needs to be made. This is this is really an, a, an amazing movie. I mean, you get to see every everybody from... Uh, Cesar Romero to Burgess Meredith and Frank Gorshin dropping acid. It's it's just unreal. It's beautiful and has the uh, fashion model Doniale Luna, who is Groucho Marx's squeeze in this movie, is you know beautiful eye candy from days gone by. Wow. I have never seen that film. Actually, I would very much like to see it. I have, it's but I've never seen it. Really amazing. And on top of that, Harry Nilsson does a soundtrack. Cause that's oh, not to mention film. John Philip Law, who I think is one of the really uh, un- underrated gems from the 60s. He was also in Barbarella. That's right. Was Wait, what was the flick? I don't think it was Barbarella, but wasn't there a flick where he played a blind angel? That's Barbarella. That is Barbarella? Okay. Yep. Yeah. And, I, by, I, and by the way, uh, the, the, going back to the Shark Tank thing, uh, that, uh, that was Freddie Valentine, who, a.k.a., uh, uh, Fred Olin Ray. Fred Olin Ray wrestled as, as Freddie Valentine, and he did have a piranha uh, where they were going to like. Uh, I think somebody had to stick their head. The the the, fa- the more famous one. Actually, you know, we should have uh, Craze on the show one time because he worked that promotion. And I think that's he right. Was, he was either involved in the piranha match or he was involved in the rattlesnake match with the rattlesnake in a box. We do have to have him on sometime. This is way overdue. Yeah, because actually that was the only the other time I remember. I think it was. A Paul Boss show, and I think somewhere in the 1980s, when all of a sudden everybody who had any wrestling footage was releasing it on VHS, um, that there was a footage of Dusty Rhodes versus Ivan Koloff, and I forgot what they called the match, but it was a it was a coffin match where you put your opponent in the coffin, and there was a giant snake in the coffin. <laughs> I love it. And the coffin was actually in the ring. So the guys, you know, Koloff and, and Dusty were bouncing off the coffin, and eventually Dusty, of course, threw Koloff into the coffin and slammed the lid. Bosch actually came up with some pretty cool shit. I don't know who was booking for him, but I, 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 I mean, I know a lot of people knock it, but I dug the moon, man. <laughs> that would have been cool. It's too bad but he I got think his, I think his real name was cooler, though. And, his and real I, name? Uh, the other name, but he went under. I forgot what it was now. Oh, oh, but the Bushman. I thought the, the Bushman. Bushman was a great That's name. cool too. Yeah, I got to admit. I thought the Bushman was a really kind of a cool name because it was back for like a, a a Kamala type character back then. I love it. I totally love it. Now, one I do remember Craze. I think his greatest memory was he talked about he actually wrestled Terry Funk on one of the shows. Yes, he did. Which you know, no matter how many matches you have. There's a DVD that exists out there. Uh, it's something like wrestling's craziest matches or whatever, and I think you can probably uh, find it. And uh, if you can, it's probably worth it because what happened was Fred Olin Ray was a, a guy uh, that di- directed a lot of low-budget films in the 1980s, and he was a friend of Johnny Legend's, 
And um, he, I don't know who trained him to be a wrestler, but for a while he had a promotion that ran in Reseda uh, in a place where eventually I think PWG got their start at one is that, point. Is that where PWG came came about? I think I think they were I, I think they <laughs> were working in the yeah they were working in the because uh, there was a really nice little um, like a, an Elks Lodge or something there that had had a real nice big room and he was running shows there and he would bring in like Terry Funk to be his tag team partner and stuff or he would bring in Abdul the Butcher uh, and it was basically you know he wrestled as Freddie Valentine um, he wasn't you know I. I he wasn't going to, you know, give Carl Gotch any nightmares, but you know, uh, <laughs> he was basically kind of your your ECW brawler. Kind uh, of a, sounds like he was kind of a bit of a fan who was living his dream. Yeah, kind of like kind of like a, a you know a um, uh, kind of like an Axel Rotten type guy. Uh, that's the kind of uh, though uh, the, though I'm sure Axel had a lot more uh, training than uh, than Freddie did, but he would <laughs> bring these guys in, and I remember that. There was that. I think it was like Terry Funk and Freddie Valentine against somebody and Abdul the Butcher or whatever. And all I remember is there's this, this sequence like afterwards where Funk is walking around the ring with Freddie Valentine and he looks over at one point and looks at him like, my God, how is this guy my partner? <laughs> he just has that look about it at that point. Oh, Lord. That, now, that, I remember that was a time when I was... I was probably most removed from uh, attending shows. I was kind of out of touch with everybody. Well, that's back when you were a lucha snob at that point. Uh, yeah, I, 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 actually, I think that was that area, that period of time when I was working for the post office and did nothing but work for the post office. Because when you work for the post office, you're working sixty plus hours a week. That's true. And so I had nothing going outside. But I remember hearing about those shows. And, and the last thing we need is somebody from the post office being disgruntled. We know what happens then. <laughs> yes, the El, uh, El Asesino Postal right. takes his gun and starts well, you know, mowing we people down. About, we talked about before. We met in 1990. So this 1989, been, uh, 1989, San Bernardino right. Arena. This would have been, well, this have been a, I guess this would have been a little, no, it wouldn't have been a little before. It would have been after that, wouldn't it? Oh yeah, quite a bit. I, if if yeah. I remember correctly, it was more late '90s or early. Yeah, early... because I I remember what I always remember was really funny about it was um, when I first started talking to you, you were a real old school lucha guy. I mean, yeah. that was the whole thing was, and you didn't like any. And uh, and you know, we were doing that promotion with Johnny, and Johnny was bringing in these characters and changing their names and doing all this stuff, and you were not crazy about that at all at that time. Yeah, no, I'll be honest, I wasn't. Um, I mean, what can I say? I've done a, I mean, I'll be honest, I thought some of the gimmicks were, you know, kind of dim, but um, no, I I wasn't cool. I was was a very traditional Lucha fan. Yeah. And especially when you had somebody who was, I I guess at the time what was going through my mind was you had this guy like Sikosis, who at the time was Salvaje, and was getting a real rep as a local worker. Yeah. And suddenly you want a, you know want to put a white mask over and call him the Reanimator. Um, <laughs> so that was Ricky Itaki. Yeah, Ricky. They they teamed together. Yeah, Ricky. Itaki and they wrestled was the Superboy Reanimator. and yeah. who was the other cat they wrestled? Um, yeah, no. And then to be honest with you, back then I had a bit of a bug up my ass. But um, I, I guess there was a bit of a frustration to see these guys who were really just freaking awesome yeah. workers. And you know they're just kind of putting these throwaway matches. And it's so funny now because when you think about it, that's virtually what everybody does. I mean, if you're doing, you know, if you go to the WWE or if you go to, uh, you know, let's say Pro Wrestling Revolution or any of these new uh, these shows, the, well, the thing they want to do is they want to give you a persona so they can own that persona. And basically, if there's any money to be made off it, they can do it. But yeah, back then that was something that was, and I remember being a little. You know, off put it because my feeling was, oh, well, these guys are wrestling as other characters. You know, Johnny, why are we doing it this way? But you know, Johnny's whole thing was he was coming off of his reputation of, of you know of of not an incredibly strange wrestling yet, but getting close to it. And his whole thing was about these bigger than life characters who were had the alliteration. You know, the gravel gut Gomez's. We talked about those guys before and and that kind of stuff. And he, his feeling was, I'm going to bring these guys in, and I'm going to give them all, you know, these, um, you know, these, these um, uh, incredibly strange video type names. 
like you know, Mary Tyler, they, like Mary Tyler Moron. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> or the the smut peddler, or uh, any of those different characters like that. So he was always trying. He was, you know, Johnny really, really was whether you like it or not. Uh, probably a good ten years before his time. Oh, he was, and it, I mean, if he just kind of had a little more focus and organization, I think he could have gone far with his whole concept. Yeah, um, and if he had copyrighted Incredibly Strange Wrestling, he could have saved himself a lot of, of static later on. He really could have. I mean, that's the thing. He's kind of always going in 15 different directions at once, working on 15 different projects. And and to be, I mean, just to be straight with you, yeah, to be honest, I kind of had a bug up my ass back then. I, I took things way too seriously when I was younger. That's one of the things I do not miss about being young is I think you tend to take yourself way too seriously when you're Yeah, you were a real dick. No, <laughs> yeah, I know. Nobody liked me. I had no friends. Yeah, no Except friends. Except you, Dan, you'd be friends with anybody, wouldn't you now? <laughs> <laughs> well, I could see there was insanity deep inside there, so that didn't bother me so much. But Yeah, and I, I just really... had to let it out. And i gotta, I got to tell you, in all honesty, Johnny Legend is who one of the people who helped spring it free because I – We'll never forget doing our very first Incredibly Strange Wrestling show up in San Francisco. Uh, Physico and I, uh, uh, we drove up there with uh, my bro-in-law, Tony, and our friend Zane. And we're saying, what is this shit Johnny's going to have us do? And uh, we just kind of rolled our eyes at it. And as soon as he put uh, Physico in the Cletus the Fetus Kincaid costume... <laughs> I've I've known Fizzy since high school, and I never thought I would see see him go nuts in public. But he started just throwing himself into the turnbuckle, screeching at the top of his lungs, tackling me and humping me. And um, I just thought that don't get more bitching than that. And then they put me in the abortionist outfit. And I went in this very bloody smock in front of the San Francisco crowd, you know, <laughs> uh, grinding, you know, doing a grinding motion with a coat hanger. And I thought, yeah, it's time to let loose. So I, I got to be honest, uh, in that sense, Johnny liberated us. And well, I think, it's, I think at some point, I think what happened was you took a clothesline and it knocked the stick up that was up your ass out. <laughs> and that's yes. Because <laughs> no, I do remember, it was very funny how it happened out of nowhere because, excuse me one second. <clears throat> Excuse me, uh, but what happened was that all of a sudden, you know, you were doing this, and I was like, it was one of the things you do where you do a double take. You go, "Oh, Kurt's playing the uh, the abortionist." Wait a minute, Kurt's playing the abortionist? You know, <laughs> and because I do, and it was very, it was very funny. And, and as I tease you about being, you know, you know, hardcore and stuff about it, no, you were, you were a lot like a lot of guys who. Uh, were following wrestling at that time as wrestling was changing. I mean, I remember, you know, you would go back in the in the late '80s or whatever. You would read the the letter page of the Observer, mm-hmm. and the whole idea was all these guys saying, "Well, I see so and so is sold out now, and it's going to be going to McMahon and uh, or going to Capitol." As they always said uh, at that point, because it was Capital Wrestling, or going to New York. Uh, a lot of fans always make fun of that today, but truthfully, that's what it was referred to back then. It was, you know, yeah. we're, you know, in New York. That's where you're always were headed and um but i remember that uh it was so funny because you know i talked to you after uh like one of the shows or whatever after the like johnny had put on and and you were very serious and well dan you know there's some really good stuff there but there's also some stuff there very and i think what happened was when you started wrestling again somehow because at that point you weren't really wrestling yet still that's true yeah, yeah, I, I when we first met I think it was a good two years before I actually started actively wrestling again. Yeah. And once you started wrestling again, I think it was one of those things where you just started to to lighten up. And there is a thing, as you do get older, where you relax on stuff and you and you look back at other stuff and you go, I can't really believe I was that serious about it. You know, uh, I mean, I've loved professional wrestling, but I don't think I've ever been mad enough to scream about it. Yeah, yeah. And I, you know... Part of the thing I dug about the, I mean, the, the old Lucha Libre is I love how it was set up where guys would keep a gimmick for many years. And if yeah. they're unmasked, you know, there's a lot of hesitation if they, if they put another hood on and went under, under a total different identity. And I kind of dug that strange uh, in-between 
that that strange uh, juggling of fiction and reality. Yeah. Where you know once once your supernatural identity has been taken away, your your kind of your identity, your character is half human, half fantasy. You know. Yeah. Uh, Cien Caras or Moscaro Anio Dos Mil. He's still Moscaro Anio Dos Mil, though he has not had the hood in years. Um. And yeah, no, and and like I said, I just took myself way too seriously, and um, I also remember a lot of uh, other indie workers around that time took themselves pretty seriously too. Oh yeah, like who? Yeah, Donnie it. was one of the people who kind of taught us to. There were a lot of guys, and and still, name you them, guys, name them, name them. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I love Fredo. Most, of, most of them are e- most of them are either out of the business or dead now. Oh, that's the whole yeah, thing. That's true. Uh, but uh, a lot of the guys, you know, there were a lot of guys in the eighties, and and I've mentioned this before, who were like, I remember this one guy. Well, the guy, all right, I remember the guy who played Davy the Observer Meltzer. Oh that, yeah, that very first UWF show. I think the guy's name was Adam, and he was he one was, of Vern Langdon's students. No, he was actually one of Billy Anderson's students. Oh, you're right. I forgot that. That's when Billy, Billy was working out Billy of Slammers. Was, Billy was training out of Slammers. And Billy had a lot of guys at that point uh, who were like, you know, they said, oh, look, Hulk Hogan has a great body. I have a great body. I can be a wrestler. Yes. You know, and that's where all these, like, Barbarian and Zeus guys type came from out of nowhere, or Warlord, that kind of stuff. And this guy was a used car salesman. And he had, you know, he had this this really, uh, you know, Don Diamond curly haircut. And that that goes way back for. <laughs> I a lot remember of him there. well. <laughs> but uh, had that really curly, like seventies, well, curly porn. orange hair. Yeah, like a, like a like a really a, a really tight curled porn afro type thing. And he was about and, a foot shorter than Don Diamond. Yeah, and he was this little guy. He looked like Lou Costello, Lavin Costello, <laughs> and he wanted to be a wrestler, and. Um, and he would ask these really stupid questions, like you know, uh, hey Bill, how good is is this guy for Japan, Inuki? Inuki, <laughs> you know, uh, you know. And when when Bruno says a variation of that, it's kind of charming. But when this guy said it, it just looked like a dork. And uh, and all the other guys would laugh at him. And he didn't really, you know, he's one of those guys that would not spend a lot of money on the on the um, on the outfits and stuff. And uh, again, it never really. You know, he learned how to do a couple clotheslines, and he learned enough to to do a squash match or two, and that's where he went in and did that. But uh, again, he's just one of those guys that thought, "I'm going to come into wrestling, and I'm going to be a big star." You know, and there mm-hmm. were a lot of guys. There were a lot of of assassins and executioners and and uh, hangmen and guys like that around that time who came in and they had these giant bodies and they thought that they were going to be. You know, uh, they, they thought it was you know, a simple a simple entry into a big business. They thought it was really easy. All I got to do is go in and pose, throw some some holds around or whatever, and and then then I can win, and I'll I'll be in the WWF in a year or two, and that'll be it. You know, and they never really you know, they basically they learned the hard way. I'm sure a lot of those guys that started working the. Um, um, the UWF tapings as, as enhancement guys, or whenever they would go and do shows, either the showboat at the AWA or uh, or do the um, the WWF shows. Um, you know, uh, when you came in and you worked as an enhancement talent or jobbers, um, eventually, you know, you, you find out what kind of what kind of life it is to live, and you basically find out that. In very rare exceptions, this is about as far as you're going to go. Because yeah, you're going to be, uh, yeah, especially back in those days, you're going to, you know, be eating canned tuna most of the times. And yeah, you're going to be lucky to eat canned tuna. Yeah, yeah, you might be eating ramen every day, you know. And, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Again, that's where the you know the old bologna blowouts come from. I mean, yeah, you'd be, that's what you you do. And and there were a lot of guys like that, and, and we all know them, and and some of them, you know, at I, when I say pass away, I'm not even joking because a lot of those guys took all kinds of stuff to make their their bodies bigger or better. And they whatever. really thought that was going to be the key. And they did. And and within ten years, the problem was well, not less than that. Within like two or three years, they were done with wrestling, but the damage they'd done to their bodies was so great that oh, it actually killed them. And that's yeah. and that's heartbreaking. The, the naivete yeah. and the just you know being clueless as to how. Hard it was to get your foot in the door 
Yeah. And, you know, that's the whole thing is when you watch that stuff and you see the guys cheering, you don't think about the fact that, you know, you're, you might get 10 bucks a match if you're lucky, and then you get in a car with, uh, you know, with eight other guys, and either you're driving through the desert to go to Arizona to, to you know, to do shows at an Indian reservation, or you're driving through uh, the frozen tundra trying to get to some, you know, bingo hall someplace yeah. where you're going to, you know, appear in front of three or four guys. I mean... Even the you know, the Lucha guys, I think, had a better head for that because they fully expected that. I mean, they were kind of brought up that way. Because, I mean, you know, we used to go to some Lucha shows, and some of them, if they were like all nations, uh, training there and people knew, um, uh, you know, where the shows were, and they would just go to them automatically. And then there were other times, you know, we would see shows with Conan and Rey Mysterio Jr. on them, and they had eight people in the audience. Yeah. Yes, it's true, and a lot of those the local indie lucha guys, a, a lot of them, they trained really hard and worked really hard, but a lot of them knew they were working hard at having fun. They knew, you know, I'm still going to be working at, uh, at at Pet Boys or for the newspaper in 10 years. Well, I, 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 that's one of the things that actually really drew me to the local lucha scene was, yeah, you, you know, you had your, you still did have your egos and stuff like that. But not everybody was this. Oh, I'm you know my goal is Arena Mexico or getting WWE. They were kind of like, yeah, I have a job. I like doing this. You know. Well, and I think it's a, a lot of that had to do just with the culture of lucha libre, and especially on a local basis. A lot of those guys, their fathers, their uncles, their brothers, or whatever, were wrestlers, and they in turn saw it as like getting into the family business. And they would go and train and learn how to do it. And for them, it was kind of like, you know, there are a lot of guys that take painting lessons or drawing lessons. And they're never going to be a professional painter or or an artist or whatever. But they do it because they want to learn how to do it. And it's something that's, you know, in a way cultural. And they they want to express themselves creatively. And that's what a lot of the Lucha guys did. They maybe, they knew they weren't going to do anything more than just like the local shows around here. Uh, unless uh, some weird break showed up or whatever. But in general, it was a chance to go out and do something that they enjoyed, uh, and they were doing it, as you said, for the fun of it or for the fact that it was just something that um, that culturally was, was really cool to do. In, yeah, in their blood. Well, and you and I have both seen this. I, I still find it moving when Kayam and Enigma de Oro wrestle on a local show. You know, their, their father uh, was a wrestler named Chivo Garcia, who passed away a few years ago. I, I find it very moving that when, uh, you know, Kayam, you know, gets his gym back out, that he has a little black and white fo- photo of his father that he puts up. Yeah. As he's getting ready. I, I, I you know. Yeah, I mean, and, yeah, he's not know, the only second-generation wrestler. Well, in, no, and, and we know from, from talking to him, you know, Kayam became a wrestler because he saw his father do it, and he wanted to do it, and he wanted to carry that on. As to honor his father and also to bring what he could to the business, and that's really different from a guy who's a used car salesman who says, <laughs> yeah, "I want to, I want to come in and be the the next big, uh, you know, Hulk Hogan." Well, you know, when I'm done training here, I'm going to go to Japan. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, and you know, when they found out there was no money and they actually got hurt at it, they didn't want to do it anymore. Where uh, some of the local lucha guys knew there was no money and knew that they might be hurt, but they wanted to do it because it was just something that, that was in their blood. Yeah. I, I, I do remember one of the things that would actually kind of, you know, like wrestling on the Lucha shows. Uh, I remember I, I went to Gills a lot, trained a lot, and, you know, I, I felt like really good when they finally started booking me on some shows because I felt like, oh, my God, like they're accepting me and, yeah. You know, they're letting me wrestle on the lucha shows, mm-hmm. and I remember, you know, I I occasionally get people like, you know, I got Greg Regalado on some of the shows. Yeah, and I felt a little, a little, how would I say, gun shy because I didn't want to say, okay, I ha- have all these American friends here, book them on your show, please. Yeah, uh, but gradually, you know, people would come around and you know wanted to get booked on the All Nation Center shows or La Fogata, yeah. and. Uh, some of them, not uh, Greg, wasn't one of them. But there's a few guys who were saying, "Okay, what we got to do is we'll have one match, and then the next week we'll have a match where the loser has to eat dog food, and then next week we'll have a, a dog collar match." And I'm telling them, guys, 
we're on a Lucha Libre show. We're new in here. I mean, the guys in the main event didn't just walk in yesterday and say, I want to yeah, be in the main event. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> a few of the guys wanted to do Japan style matches, you know, these long, you know, tag matches like they saw on Giant Baba Which TV. It's not going to work for a Lucha audience at all. Exactly. And I, again, I told them, no, this is an audience who wants to see good guys and bad guys. Yeah. And they and want it in very dramatic fashion. Yeah, and yeah, you know, I knew this was going to happen, but I, I remember there's a, about a month where I, you know, wasn't on any of the shows. So when I wasn't on one of the shows and they got booked uh, in a tag match, they said, "Okay, we're going to do a Japan style tonight," and uh, so they did a Japan style match that went on forever. And then I remember uh, it was when Steve Sims was uh, first in the area, and I said, uh, and he said, "Yeah, they did the Japan style match at All Nation." I'm going, "How did it go?" And he just says, audience had no idea what they were trying to do. <laughs> wow. And so I sat back and snickered. I was right. I was right. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I mean, you know, sometimes people forget that, uh, you know, uh, they re- you know they refer to it as a Japan-style match, which means it works really well in Japan. Right. But it doesn't exactly. mean it's going to work anyplace else. And it's great that you like that and that you enjoy that. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with experimenting once in a while. You've got to know what your audience is. And, and now, you know, with a lot of, of, of wrestling fans, if you go past and, and go to your, you know, your, your so-called smart fans or whatever and the guys that are, you know, who, who follow everything and know everything, they're aware of what different styles are and they might appreciate them or be more – uh, open to them, but you know, if a if a wrestling if a, a regular crowd wanders in to see, you know, if we're doing an MPW show at, at Yankee Doodles or the Hub or whatever they call it, you know, and we come in and we do a forty five minute match uh, with all this, you know, that's all heavily heavily Japan, um, they're not going to care and they're going to lose interest in it. Right. Uh, we did a, a lot of matches that were very strong style and high flying. And a lot of the stuff that was set up that way, they were that was being done that way. But um, you know, it's one of those things where you know you really got to have the right audience for that, and they and they really need to know something. If they're just there to watch a couple of guys wrestle, they're not going to appreciate that. Because I know that I remember when I first started getting tapes and stuff, and been a I had started watching wrestling in the, like nineteen nineteen seventy one, and. I remember in the you know by the mid '80s, all of a sudden there were these things, these videotapes, and there was always you go into the video store and there was always something like you know wrestling's wackiest matches. <laughs> you know? Yes, yes. And it was always either you know old matches from some place or public domain matches or whatever. And I think there was oh god, there was a, one of the first ones was there was something called Monsters of the Mat. Oh yeah. And, uh, and, and there was a, there was one with Sergeant Slaughter and one. Uh, there's a couple, of, but a lot of them were the the, uh, the uh, mid south stuff. Yeah, mm-hmm. and I remember, or some stuff from Texas too. But I remember one of them on there had, like, a, I think it was a Ric Flair Terry Taylor match that ran like 45 minutes. Oh my! And Lord. I re- remember when I first watched it, I was bored out of my mind. <laughs> now I've been wow. a wrestling fan for like 15 years, you know, and but I had only seen certain types of matches. I had seen a WWF style match. That's all. You know, I had never really seen and California that's, matches by that time, but nothing, nothing like that at all. But I remember, like ten years later, seeing that match, and I was like, "Oh, I remember watching this match off this tape one time." It wasn't really, and I watched it again, but because I learned a lot in that time, I looked at it completely different, and I enjoyed the match much better by that point. But yeah. that's that's not how it's supposed. That's not really how it's supposed to be. Uh, you know, you're not you're not really supposed to, to. You know, it's nice to try to educate a fan and show them different styles and different you know stuff like that. But you know, it's either something they're going to get or they're not going to get, or they're going to like or they're not going to like. You know, it's like it's like marathon matches. Uh, you know, the uh, Iron Man matches they do. I was right. At, I, it's, I, there's there's matches that the hardcore fans are gonna really dig and appreciate, but they are a very small percentage of the overall wrestling audience who's paying. Yeah, I mean, I was, I was at the Iron Man match with Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels at WrestleMania down the pond all those many years ago. And, um, I remember that, that, you know, basically the the reaction to the the audience was that of boredom because they, even they knew that, you know, they were going to go for one hour. So, most people went out to the bathroom or get something to eat or, 
to go to Yeah, the, but you know what? I was thing. I was there I was there too and if you remember it seemed like the last maybe 10 minutes of it they were really getting into it. Well, yeah, that's the whole idea. That yeah. what they, what they did was they know how it works, so we'll come back at the 50 minute mark and then we'll watch the rest of the match. Right. So they were getting into it mainly because they knew at that point was the time that they were going to and that's how, you know, cuz you can watch it. You watched how you know, Brett and Sean laid everything out and how, you know, they were taking their time and how they were, you know, building the right. stuff. And then when it became obvious that they weren't going to do any falls, you know, then they basically faded. And you knew, you know, you knew that by, you know, the, the 50 minute mark, mm-hmm. that's when stuff was going to happen. Nothing was going to happen that early. That's when the plot was really a, truly unfolding. Yeah, right. exactly, and that's the whole that's the whole problem with the, with an Iron Man match that goes like an hour is that well if you're going to go an hour everybody knows well I'll come back for the last fifteen minutes because that's when anything good's going to happen it's going to happen there. But do you guys remember the Iron Man match that was on SmackDown with uh, Kurt Angle and uh, Brock Lesnar? Brock Lesnar, you know, mm-hmm. I was I mean, maybe I'm different, but I was glued that entire time. I mean, that was just a, a really really entertaining match I thought the well whole you've time. always been you've always been different Ryan <laughs> uh, just, but was this that now, I remember that was a full hour wasn't it yeah but didn't they also go to commercial on a couple times they, on it yeah that's true they did and yeah. Kurt Angle is like like amazing in the ring he can keep yeah. you glued to almost anything yeah no that I mean, was that, a that was a great match I, I do remember that one that. match right Kurt what's that except that one match <laughs> Except which one? <laughs> which no, one, Matt? Did, did you watch that match? Which one? The one with him and Lesnar? Yeah. Yeah, I actually did watch that. Oh, cool. Okay. Yeah, yeah. believe it or not, there was, there was a WWE match I actually saw. <laughs> that was a long time <laughs> I know it's <laughs> rare. <laughs> but then again, you know, as you were saying, was look at, you know, you were talking about the ones that we get into and the ones that we like and everything. Um, you know, you're talking about... Um, Shawn Michaels, you're talking about Bret Hart, you're talking about uh, Brock Lesnar and, and Kurt Angle. Uh, right. Those yeah. are those are those are different kinds of animals altogether. Yeah. Those those are guys that are meant for that match, and they're probably the only guys now that, off the top of my head, and, and I know I'm leaving people out, but I think of guys like Davey Richards or people like that. Yeah. They can do that stuff, but that's you know, boy, you put a lot of guys out there. And, you know, you say we're going to do... That's why you don't see a lot of the hour matches. And truthfully, I think, um, <laughs> unless you really have the right people, um, I'd rather see a, a good two out of three fall match that goes like 45 minutes than I would to do the hour. I remember seeing matches sometimes where, you know, when they would get down to five minutes to remain. Yeah. You know, uh, kind with, of a lost art. And you would kind of figure, okay, well, this is going to be a draw because just for the signal of it. And I do remember one time seeing a match where one guy beat the other guy at the 19-minute, 55-second mark. And <laughs> I remember I was, in LaBelle's territory, they would do that frequently. Uh, I was shocked by that. Because they would have 20-minute draws, but they would have uh, um, you know matches where somebody won at the 18- or 19-minute mark. And I mean, the, the LaBelle did a lot of screwy things, but uh, there are some, you know, some things they did that kind of kept people's attention peaked, you know? Yeah. I think I, I think that'll bring that back and also bring back the referee standing in between the two wrestlers getting ready to raise their hands and then starting to raise the one wrestler's hand and all of a sudden jerking the other wrestler's hand yes. up in the air. Yes. That was priceless. That, <laughs> that is so cool. Holy red shoes. <laughs> you know, I, I I do miss uh two out of three fall matches. I do too. I, I really do because there was a whole uh, a whole psychology to it and a whole different thing and and, you know, a lot of times you could figure things out, but sometimes you couldn't. But it just was a different energy and a different psychology to it. But even nowadays, I would think that, you know, when you do a two out of three fall match, it needs to be the right guys. Yeah, it I can't agree. Be, it can't be Kofi Kingston and Cody Rhodes. You know, you'd just be bored to tears after the first, you know, the first fall. Well, maybe Cody Rhodes might, actually. I don't, really? you know, I don't, think, I don't think he's that bad. That's a horrible way to say that. I don't think he's that bad. It's kind of like <laughs> I, have a, I have a friend who watches something, and the way he judges things is he goes, well, that didn't suck. And that's, like a <laughs> <laughs> and that's the kind of way I know. Are, Fred, are you referring to that uh, that match he had that's supposed yeah, to be on yeah, TV where he got busted open from head to toe? Yeah. Somehow? 
Yeah, yeah supposedly was... they're going to have a, a hell of a time editing that thing. Just the picture alone, they looked crazy. Did that happen uh, uh, this, this past Tuesday? Yeah, yeah. he got he banged, he got uh, busted open the hard way, and evidently was just uh, like uh, they like talked about up. the the Briscoe brother job, a uh, uh, blade job from uh, about a week or so earlier, where uh-huh. you know there was the pictures of him laying with his head in a pool of blood. That this was worse. Yeah. Wow. And, and they, they said they're going to have to Tim do Paul, um, almost Tim Tall Tree esque. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> tall tree esque. I love. That. I like that. I like that. That should be uh, a, a, in but, Funk and Wagnall's dictionary. They're going to have to do. They're going to have to do a, a hell of a of um, of a, an Edit. editing job, or they're going to have to go black, black and white. And white. Uh, black and white is my is my bet. They'll go black and white for that. I love yeah. the old school from the seventies where they would, uh, you know, put instead of pixeling out somebody's face, they'd put that big dark the red X. X. On <laughs> yeah. Well, that's how they. That's how I first remember Fred Blassie, because when they first brought Fred Blassie into the East Coast to go up against Pedro Morales, and I would say that would probably be late '71, early '72. Uh, what he would do is he would wrestle guys, and I still remember these guys like Tomas Marin and Mike Pappas, the Flying Greek. Uh, and, uh, I, I like Mike Pappas. <laughs> yeah. And what they would do is he would uh, he would start biting on them, and then they would put this giant red X across the screen. <laughs> and then they would always, you would always hear like, and you knew they dubbed him in, uh, like women screaming and stuff. Yeah. And, and, and sometimes know, they, would say, they would show the same shot of the audience over and over again. Yeah. And when they brought in, when uh, Albano was managing the, the spoiler, Don Jardine, they brought him in without the hood, and he, they did the same thing with the claw. He would put the claw on guys, and the guys would start to bleed, and they'd put a big X across the screen then. And that always was really, you know, again, it's one of those things where it was traumatizing, uh, you know, because it, it, you imagined it to be much worse. You know, you were thinking, God, his eyeball popped out or something. You know? Yeah, well, I, I remember uh, when in 1975 they were airing WWF on some of the uh, on one of the Spanish stations here. And I can't remember what the Wolfman told was. It was a, a variation of the claw or something like that. Mm-hmm. But they did the X, but the X missed. It wasn't where it was supposed to be, and it was somewhere on his body. And I thought, wait, does he have a terrible boil or something they don't want us to see, or did did he fall out of his trunks or something? Yeah, his trunks fell out or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. That kind of reminds me of the uh, more recent uh, time of when Outlaw Ron Bass was taking the uh, spurs across Brutus Beefcake, and they put the red X up. Oh, yeah. But you could could still sort of see Beefcake's face, and absolutely nothing was happening. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> or the other, the other famous one, of course, was the uh, the Dusty Roads make it good thing they did with the Horsemen. Was oh yeah, thing where they oh, made nice. that much worse. And you know that was one of those weird things where somebody like um, like you know Dusty came up with the idea, you know, cut me on my arm. I'm going to blade on my arm. You know? <laughs> and uh, and it, but it was so different, you know, it was it's so, something different that that it. Uh, and I remember several times Dusty would blade on the arm from time right. to time. You know, they yep. would put the the claw hold on the arm, or they would start beating the arm, or doing stuff like that. Well, but, in fact, uh, I remember uh, in yeah, like the late seventies when the Sheik stopped uh, blading his forehead and would blade his arms all the time. Yeah, and I can't remember who it was, but somebody who like was working the, D- the Detroit promotion said it's because he just he just carved up his forehead so much that well, I yeah, guess nope. a, do- a doctor told him. You know, like you're risking blood poisoning or something like that. Well, there was no place left. To, yeah, there was no place left to cut. I mean, that <laughs> yeah. was just basically that was a topographic map of the Andes. I mean, that was there was <laughs> nothing there that you could do. You had to. It was either that or go to the back of the head. You know. Yeah, and it didn't quite have the same charm that Abdullah's head has. Yes, <laughs> that's a that's a nice way to refer to a charm. Yeah, that's a, charm. That's well, a, yeah, I've heard wrestlers say that Abdullah to crack people up in the dressing room would stick coins in uh, yeah. the grooves in his head. Sure. Yeah, I hear that all the I've heard that story millions of times that people would do that. But, uh, you know, just thought of being anywhere, you know, I, I luckily never had to referee a match with Abdullah, but I would have been scared shitless. Because, you know, the guy basically figured anybody with the arm's reach, what well, he could blade game. him with that fork. Yeah, Exactly, open season in his mind. Yeah, now, exactly. Now, now Ryan, yeah. I don't know if you... Uh, Saw what I posted on your Facebook page last night. <laughs> I did. 
And by the way, I love it when I read the description of this show and go, what the hell is this? Well, we're talking about where did this stuff come from? This is something, this is amazing. Yeah, there you could say that. On Although, Although okay. I, I was really motivated when you sent that to me, and I thought, wow, I'm actually going to be able to see him pin someone. Now, that was my mistake. You said go over, but I I just assumed it'd be a pinfall. Of course it wasn't. But he did He did but win. He did win. <laughs> But explain explain to the people who might be listening confused what you're referring. Yes, exactly. <laughs> we're, we're going. We're we're talking in very vague terms here. Uh, a guy that we've mentioned several times on this show before. There was a jobber named uh, El Negro. His real name Dario Romero. He's uh, a <laughs> yeah, brother of laughing. Ricky Romero. <laughs> He's Ricky Romero, but without the talent. Right. Um, <laughs> Now, and boy, he showed that in this match too, as well. <laughs> it's true. Oh, it's so true. He's a really nice guy. I, I hate to say it, nice guy, but there wasn't much talent there. Now, growing up, Dan Ryan and I saw a whole array of jobbers, from Rick Drayson to Jack Armstrong to Ben Golly. Um, Mr. Mexico. Who's that? Mr. Mexico. Mr. Mexico. Yes, yes, George De La Isa. <laughs> now. Most of these guys could work, and occasionally these guys would actually go over. They would get little surprise wins on TV. Uh, you know, John Burrich, whole cast of characters, Billy Rogers. But one guy who probably made more appearances than all the other jobbers can find was El Negro. El Negro never went over except for one time. Really. He teamed with Tatsumi Fujinami against the Twin <laughs> Devils. <laughs> and the, Wait what a happened minute. Why else I remember this? Tatsumi Fujinami jumped in the ring and pinned both Twin Devils by himself. <laughs> El Negro never went in the ring. <laughs> I guess that'd be the only way for El Negro to go over. <laughs> exactly. Now, the funny thing is so many jobbers a days old, you can find a little bit of footage on. You know, Jack Armstrong, some of his Twilight Years stuff you can find. But I have never seen any El Negro footage out there. And I've never world. seen El Negro without a mustache either. That's true, huh? But yeah. He did work with that one. But not, really? it was after, well, I remember after well, Kurt, you know, he was on some of those uh, shows that you worked on when you were Jimmy Cyclone. Well, in fact, that's the one that got posted to right. YouTube. Yeah, uh, but, he, how did but they get he, that? Didn't, he didn't have a mustache, I think, for a while there because it was hard to. Because again, he had a, like a lot of, you know, a lot of, you know, you could do a contest sometime if you put up two pictures and said, "1970s pro wrestler or porn actor." <laughs> Because they all had that look to them. Like That's right. You could, put, you could put your hero, Al Madrill, in that category, That's too. That's right. Too. Exactly. <laughs> I know. They, but, all, they all had the John Holmes face, but they did not have the John Holmes bag, bat, bragging rights they, downstairs. They all had the, the big the big Magnum uh, or the big Kung Fu, uh, not Kung Fu, uh, Fu Manchu mustache. They all had, a, there was a lot of fro stuff going on. That's right. There was a lot of... of like a uh, really feathered type hair. Yeah, both yeah. El Negro and Mondo Lopez had the froze. In fact, you had a pretty good fro going as Jimmy Cyclone, I've seen everyone. <laughs> no, I had a retarded haircut. I had a very, very retarded haircut that was somewhere in between uh, long hair and a mullet, and it was sad. I remember, because I remember watching you when, the first time I saw you come out there in Reseda, I thought, oh, how nice they're letting the little the, the little developmentally disabled kid rest. <laughs> uh, That's funny. Was that the one where I was beating my chest chest with my wrist? <laughs> yeah, I always I always found that funny when you would come out, and, you know, I think you had, like, one pair of, like, red trunks, didn't you? Was that red trunks? Yes, I did, because it was so hard to find anybody who could make gear. The only... Uh, People who were reliable who made gear was uh, K&H in Ohio. That's right. Is That's that, where everybody but, got their trunks, and they all got their uh, boots from Noel Ash, who was Bill Ash's father. That's right. But I remember how it was funny because they would always you – know, any of those early tapes, and again, it's it's really not fair to do because you were only like had working, what, a year or two at that point? You know, uh, like about yeah, a year not even two. a year. Yeah, and what they would do is, you know, at one point your big spot was – you would take, you know, you would make a fist and you would like pound your chest, <laughs> yeah. like like King Kong. 
yeah. or something. And, That's intimidating. <laughs> you know, because it was kind of like, it was really funny because, you know, again, they had you working with guys that were much bigger than you, which I, I understand in a way what they were trying to do, but, you know, the Pistol Peets and those guys were really pretty much much bigger than you, and, and sometimes, you know, it just, it looked like a mismatch. It was a mismatch, and, and the funny thing that was there were luchadores on these shows who were about my size, and I could have worked with well, and I probably yeah. would have learned more from them, to be well, honest that, with you. that's what was funny, because it truly, I think you, all joking aside, you kind of had a Shawn Michaels career, and by that I mean is, you know, Shawn Michaels came out, did his whole career, and then he retired. And then he came back and wound up working another eight years, and it was like a different guy from night and day. And, and you know, and I think I think uh, and other people have said this too. Uh, what made him a Hall of Famer was those last eight years, even more so than yeah, the earlier years. Absolutely. And I know that when you first started out, you know, you did all those shows, and then you retired. And then when you came back as Vandal Drummond, when you were working the Lucha shows, I mean, a lot of guys who had done American style would bring an opponent with them, and they would basically do something similar to that. Yes. But you always worked with and, and asked to work with the local guys. And I loved working with the local guys. Yeah, That's right. I did not actually have a match for almost seven years. Yeah. So and I then, stopped in 84. So, yeah, and, and then when you came back as, as Vandal Drummond also, you again were mostly working with Lucha guys. Who would yeah, give you and that's what I preferred. One, they were closer stuff. to my size, and two, I, I just I thought the style was a lot more fun. Too. Well, they would give you spots, and unfortunately, those those early tapes that you see from uh, Hawaiian Gardens, and why the hell do they call that place Hawaiian Gardens? It is <laughs> the city. There's no, there's, because it, they all it, it, looks, to... it looks nothing like Hawaii, and there ain't a yeah. garden in sight. Exactly. Uh, right. Yeah, <laughs> I know that it, <laughs> and it's one of the most you know gang infested areas in Southern California too. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's not a place you're going to go vacationing. Yeah, exactly. But I would see those 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 matches and stuff, and you'd be lucky if they gave you a move at all to do. You know, you had you know you got nothing. Maybe you might throw a punch or maybe an occasional. They let me do a something. couple of slick arm drags. That yeah, kind of stuff. that kind of stuff. But well, when I, started... and that's one of the reasons I really didn't also didn't progress much as a worker is one of the negatives about having the California State Athletic Commission uh, govern wrestling back then. There were so few wrestling shows being being put on just because it cost so freaking much to do them because you had to go through the commission. Yeah. Uh, there were a ton of fees you had to pay, uh, and so there just wasn't there were much a ton opportunity. Of palms you had to grease too. So that was What's that? Yeah. There were a ton of palms you had to grease by a lot of people. Oh yes. In California State Athletic. Program. Yes. Yes. I. Yeah. <laughs> I mean. You know, and then you know, had to go through one of their doctors who were not always the most reputable uh, folk. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, uh, this this footage is El Negro in Hawaiian Gardens. Uh, in fact, I was on that show, too. Yeah. September 30th, 1983. El Negro versus Harry Hell, the punk rock wrestler. Now, this will say a lot. Were you on before or after that match? After that match. All right. So, yeah, I was not billed below that one. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he really showed. He re- he really reminded me why he was just so awful. I well, will, El, I, well, El Negro had to hang around long enough to find someone who was worse than he was to work with. <laughs> That's right. Maybe he requested to work with Harry Hell. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but Harry Hell, you know, was not as bad as El Negro, but El Negro went over because he uh, he was a squall here for choking him and you know, well, he yeah. was uh, wasn't he? I think at that time he wasn't. He was he was under his real name, but wasn't didn't they call him something like the Mexican Flash or something like that? At that oh, point? did they really? <laughs> did I think they, they I... called him something like that. I think they had some sort of fancy nickname for him, and he always appeared to be the nicest guy in the world. That's that's but, why I feel bad bagging on him because he was a very yeah, nice person. But he just he just never either he was never given the opportunity to do anything or. His, you know, and I remember. I always seemed to, to think that he, had, his aptitude wise, his the way he picked up on things, just was like about five seconds too slow. Yeah, you know, because I mean, that's I a told, good way of putting I, it. And I told this story before, and I I, I hate to, uh, but I guess since Bix isn't here, he's not going to give us hell for repeating stuff. <laughs> so, uh, Bix, are you around there? At all? Yeah, where is Bix? By the way, we miss I, you, I, Bix. He's on vacation. Uh, Hawaiian, Hawaiian Gardens. 
He's in Hawaiian right. Gardens. He's, he's enjoying the, the wonderful weather in Hawaiian Gardens. At the Gardens. Breezy Palms Hotel. <laughs> exactly. But, um, no, I remember, her, I remember yeah, I, I, oh, God, what was it? Um, I, I seem to, to remember there was a time, one time in San Bernardino, where he was wrestling Les Thornton. The Bean Machine, and Les yeah. Thornton was a great worker. He worked. Yeah. He, he was under a hood in, in World Class as Checkmate, which I always thought was a great character. And he wound up going into the the, the WWF for a while there at mm-hmm. the tail end. And he was an NWA Junior Heavyweight Champion. In fact, there was a, that famous match with the British Bulldogs against Thornton and a, a very young Mick Foley yeah. who just started out. Sure. But you know, Thornton was a tough guy, and if you sure. screwed around with him, he'd pop you one. And I still remember, you know, I, I, in San Bernardino, he was working like an opening match with Thornton. And uh, El Negro hit the ropes and came off and, like, tried to shoulder block. And, of course, it went down. And then he went off the ropes again, and he stumbled. And inst- what he did was he wound up just kind of, like, barely grazing Les Thornton. And there was a moment where he paused. And then he took a back bump. <laughs> and Les Thornton had this look on his face and proceeded just to beat the hell out of him. <laughs> and I still remember an old Hispanic gentleman standing near me turned to his friend and goes, that's real. You know, uh, because, because, he was, you know, because that was the time a period also. It was, and it was always funny because the fans who were there, they knew what was going on. But right. at the same time, they, you know, they were willing to suspend belief. Right. But that was the time when they were running the old uh, Philadelphia WWF shows out here at 11 o'clock on Saturday nights and trying to claim they were Madison Square Garden shows. <laughs> and, uh, and that, and, but here was S.D. Jones. And here was Johnny Roz as Java Rook out here or whatever. And there they were doing jobs on TV. And they, and I was really, and, and I remember this one, the one guy said, he goes, uh, he goes, uh, Java Rook was in the ring and he goes, that guy's Puerto Rican. <laughs> yeah. And I remember it was really funny also because it was California. Uh, they had one, like one Mil Mascaris match. And they kept sticking it in every week. <laughs> and every week it was it was Mill Mascaris against Chris Canyon, who of course became King Kong Bundy. Uh, and this is when he had hair. And they stuck that match in like the end of every show for like five weeks. <laughs> Just the same similar, damn match. similar to the way they would uh, every promotion would always show that old match of the Sheik versus Sailor Art Thomas over and over again. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's you know there's that <laughs> yeah there's the same match or, or the match. Or well, you know again I, there's certain matches that became legendary when they traveled. I mean Andre the Giant against Gorman and Goliath was another yeah. one of those. Uh, you know there were. Um, I remember they used, um, I think it was uh, Ray Stevens when he uh, broke the leg of, of Mr. X in the AWA, and they, they would always talk about how you know, he'd ended his career. And there, there were always these matches that were perfect that you would send around the horn when, when a guy came to a new area. Uh, but uh, that, was, uh, that was interesting because that was a time also when the um, – when the Eddie Ihorn group was running out uh, on TV on Channel 9 out here. I and, remember watching this. And that was really weird because, I mean, there was Ernie Ladd and Thunderbolt Patterson and Rip Hawk and Sweet Hansen and uh, a 16-year-old Terry Gordy and all this. And I remember going like, oh, God, oh boy, they're coming out here. Oh, boy, this group's coming out here. And then all of a sudden they were gone. Right. Yeah, that was always interesting when every now and then we'd get TV from another territory or yeah and it would air for a bit and then it would just vanish and you always wonder what the story was were were they shy you know i do know that another negative about the uh california state athletic commission is i, I know several people who would try to promote out here and oh, yeah. they say you know it, at least their claim is that the commission was pretty favorable to the labelle family and would give people a hard time yeah. running shows and the labelle family had a long you know with with the uh, Eileen Eaton's husband and the father and all this. So they've been there have been a they had been out here a long, long time. I remember uh, at one so, point at one point Eileen Eaton was uh employed by the commission, was on the yeah. board. 
And oh, she yeah. and and Michael Bell was still promoting it. That's not conflict of interest. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know what is exactly. And well, I, the, uh, uh, of course, the the the, well, the biggest problem with the Eddie I, I Horn, um, uh, and I have a bunch of these still on tape, uh, and they were fun shows. They were great shows, but uh, you know, the, and we love to bag on Mill Mascaris on this show, but that's not the guy you make your world champion. Yeah, that's no. true. That's very true. You know, first of all, I don't think the guy ever did an interview on those shows, or if he did, they were always just disasters. Yes. <laughs> you know, and was that the organization that Mill held the title for like a million years? And yeah, and after, after the organization had folded, he still was going to Japan <laughs> with the host the belt. Is that right? Doesn't he still hold the title? He still yeah, yeah. The I think he's yeah. still the champion. He still yeah. wears the belt of the ring. Exactly. <laughs> he's still the champ. Now, speaking of... Other of champions, uh, <coughs> Ryan and I wanted to discuss probably one of the most obscure tag team champion te- uh, duos ever. But they were multi-time tag team champions out here. This is true. Rick and John Davidson. The Davidson brothers. The Davidson brothers. They came in toward the end of the uh, LaBelle run, in a way. I mean, by the end of it. You know, the last five years was the end of the LaBelle run. So. I believe, yeah, I believe they came early in 1981. Yeah. No, they came, they came. Um, I would say, in the late 70s, because I remember they had, uh, they they had uh, several times they won the America's Tag Team title, but they had a, a pretty decent run at the Olympic. Yeah, no, it was, but it, the only reason I remember it was 81 is because came, I remember in back. 80 moving up to Oregon. Uh-huh. And uh, you know, you know, before I made a trip at home, I started seeing their names all over the programs. I'm going, oh my God, these are these guys who worked the Detroit territory. Right. And I came home for spring break in '81, and uh, <clears throat> the TV show that aired that week, they weren't wrestling on the show, but they were at ringside during a lumberjack match. And I just thought they had the coolest look to them. These guys with these these red Tarzan type tights who had no physiques, but each had bleach blonde hair and matching beards and mustaches. Right. Porn. 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 <laughs> so, so porn. This was like hillbilly porn. I mean, these guys look well, like they... Isn't they, that, wasn't, <laughs> wasn't one of the guys Hillbilly Jim? I was no. going to say, didn't they have Hillbilly Jim sort of hats that they wore at one point? Yeah, uh-huh. They had those big floppy hats. That's right. I seem to remember that, but the one of them was Hillbilly Jim, right? No. 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 I always well, thought that one of them was. No. No, they were, they were straight the Davidson brothers. Uh, and they were real them. brothers. They were real brothers. Yeah. And, uh, Rick Davidson, I believe, passed away in, in, in 2000, if I remember right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Staff infection. Yeah. Um, he was one the bigger, photo I the really bigger of the to, two. <clears throat> I really have to try <laughs> to dig up is the very first night Tim Flowers made his debut in San Bernardino. Uh he he played uh, the character up really flaming, and I got this great photo of him giving a a, a kiss on the cheek of John Davidson, who was his tag team partner. <laughs> and Davis this has Davidson just has this big like hillbilly grin on his face. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, they were really an interesting tag team, and they worked a number of territories. But I think very few people remember them. You know, when well, you they look weren't back the history. most memorable team. You know, they were they they were pretty you know straight ahead, but they they weren't remarkable in what they did or anything. No. But they uh, they were pretty tough guys, and and I, I remember very clearly <clears throat> watching them wrestle a handicap match against the the champion uh, Mel Muskrat. Ah. <laughs> And he he wrestled both of them, and and it was the it was the first time I had ever seen him do that move where he grabs the one guy in a headlock and then jumps up and gets the other guy in the blade okay. scissors yes. and flips them both. <laughs> 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 I just thought that was the greatest thing. Goodbye, that was the greatest thing in the world. <laughs> you know, but um, <clears throat> they were they were uh, you know pretty. They had a a um, a decent feud going on with. Uh, Cowboy Tom Pritchard and Chris Adams. And That's days, right. They actually had some good matches more, you know, because of Pritchard and Adams. They weren't this, they weren't very good workers, but they had a cool looking presence to them. I mean, when you saw them, you you thought they they like woke up in you know in the back lot or something like that, mean and angry and ready to <laughs> kick some butt. <laughs> 
Now, here's a little trivia question in regards to the Davidson brothers. Can any of you... Uh, is Fredo still there? Fredo? Wake I'll up. pretend to be Fredo. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm gone now. Okay. He's way gone, baby. He's, He's way gone. Gone. Fredo's so still upset. Fredo's still upset about the lockout. <laughs> oh, okay. Do any of you uh, know? I, I already know where you're going. Red River Jack. Oh, there oh. he is. Oh, my God, Bix. We Bix. missed you, dude. Yeah, he's like, I wasn't feeling too good. I took a nap at like 8 o'clock, and then I woke up like a few minutes ago, and I was like, oh, yeah. We, we, thought, you, we, thought, you, we thought you were in Hawaiian Gardens. <laughs> where friends meet. <laughs> Where all friends gather. That's right. <laughs> that's the place. That's the place where Kurt used to wrestle, and it was, and it, it did not live up to its name. Hawaiian there was, garden. There was no <laughs> nothing Hawaiian and nothing garden like. Yeah, it, it yeah. sounds like a very seedy hotel ballroom or something. The, yeah, it's Pretty actually much. a city, a city in Southern California. The spirits don't exactly fly there, but the bullets do. <laughs> Wait, the name of the city is Hawaii Gardens. Yes, yeah, Hawaiian uh, Gardens. Hawaiian, Hawaiian Gardens. Garden. It's not, and it's I, not, I, it's if, not if there's a palm tree anywhere to be seen, it's it's not a living palm tree. Yeah, Kurt used to lose there on a regular basis. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, I only lose in the seediest places. Well, I remember Pistol Pete once calling me all excited because uh, Hawaiian Gardens was going to have a parade and he wanted the wrestlers in it. And I think that's the first time I, I turned down a booking. <laughs> <laughs> a parade with all the wrestlers in Hawaiian yep, Gardens. Yep. There's a I, highlight of your career. And and he, he he said he said with like sincere like you know excitement and and after the parade like you get a certificate of appreciation from the city of Hawaiian Gardens and <laughs> you know I I broke out my Vaseline and just started feverishly masturbating to the thrilling thought of Hawaiian <laughs> Gardens saluting me and. Now, if you had done that in the parade, that would have been really interesting. Yeah, that... God, maybe I shouldn't have turned down that booking. <laughs> no, uh, Ryan, get back to your trivia question. We kind of okay. stomped all over that. No, <laughs> no, no, you know, because, uh, you know, we're so fascinated with the Davidson brothers. Uh, the Davidson brothers' very last tag team title reign, they had beaten the team of the fabulous Chino Cho, and can anybody guess who Chino Cho's tag team partner was? They, they were America's tag team champions. I think I know. Was it Tim Taltry? It was not Tim Taltry. Oh, hmm. Damn. Was that, let's see, well. I know it wasn't was El Negro. In, it was 1981. So, so the promotion's about to close. May have actually uh, been early '82 because the, the promotion end, ended in the end of '82, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Was it was it an international wrestler? No. It was a local guy. Yeah. Was it P.L. Blanco, aka Mickey Doyle? It was not Irish Mickey Doyle. Hmm. I should know this, and I don't. Um, was it was it a, a another wrestler who was uh, Asian? No. Actually, no. You mean they actually some some promoter actually teamed up an Asian an, an Asian wrestler with a non Asian guy? That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean he he was sort of a special attraction, and he held the America's Tag Team Title. With okay, I just looked this up because I had no idea that I checked it. But at, I'm actually it, wait. I'm actually more amazed by who Tino Cho regained the tag titles with as his replacement partner that he had, that he won the titles twice in a row with two very different wrestlers. Oh, you know what? You know what? I may have actually had that wrong. Bix, I think you actually had the, 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 the answer right there. Okay. So should I t- tell them? Yeah, go ahead and tell them. Okay, it was a speedy Waldo Guzman? No. So the Davidsons won it from Chino Cho, Cho or Chow and Gene LaBelle. That's right. Oh, my God. I forgot LaBelle did that last stint. And, uh, they right. lost as, it, and he so. was Gene. He was as Gene, right? Yeah. And, and, but then they lost it to Chino Chow and the Kiss. And Kiss. Ah, That's Kiss. right. Yes. That's right. Oh, so, my gosh. I remember I remember Gene LaBelle had uh, that feud with Peter Maivia. Six, I will never forget the six weeks in a row. Six weeks we were subjected 
to Gene LaBelle versus Peter Maivia in oh every God. in every conceivable match you could have because there was nothing going on with that promotion. So they had wow. to do that for six weeks. My it brothers and I thought we were going to die. Hey, Kurt, Kurt, say Chino Cho's name like Gene LaBelle would say it. Oh, there's Chino Cho! <laughs> <laughs> You know, my brother gave the finger to Ch- Chino Cho in the parking lot of the sports Oh, your event. brother gave the finger to everybody. What are you talking about? <laughs> Chino Cho, the pride of Guatemala. <laughs> oh, God. I remember Chino Cho uh, cut him off uh, getting out of the arena, and he... Uh, oh, no way! <laughs> he, he, gave, he gave the finger as he was passing, and it was Chino Cho. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Just gave the finger to the America's tag champ. <laughs> I, bet, I bet Larry laughed about that for hours. That oh, was. we were laughing the whole way home. We could not. And, and then, of course, we were just completely blown away that, you know, Chino Cho was actually driving. Like, we expected him to be picked up by limo or something, you know. Like, he was actually <laughs> driving himself home. You know? Maybe Chino driving a limo as, as a second job. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will never forget, there was... Uh, one memorable Davidson's brother match I will never forget. Mm. Uh, in San Bernardino, it was during the summer of 81, and uh, Joe Lightfoot came into the territory. Oh, and God. <laughs> after his first, his first uh, match at LA Sports Arena, he gave his notice. And he made one appearance at San Bernardino Arena where he wrestled uh, one of the Davidson brothers. Huh? And, of course, both Davidsons were in the ring. And Ken Wayne, you know, who Loud was one of the Ken Wayne. <laughs> yes, was one of the heels at the time, gets in the ring and starts cutting a promo on uh Joe Lifa saying, you know, I want you next week. And the Deva- Davidson brothers just go up to him as, and saying, Get the hell out of the ring, get out of here, get out of here and he he's <laughs> like, Hold on a minute, hold on a minute and then they just blindside him and he juices like a motherfucker. Oh, oh and wow. Then later in that evening, uh, the other Davidson brothers uh, wrestling Tim Talltree, and you know, just having Talltree in dire straits, and the other you know brothers double teaming, and then Ken Wayne comes running out, you know, you know, you know, proud, but, you know, you know, proud but bloody, you know, the blood's still all over his face, but the, you know, uh, rag wrapped around his head, and comes in and just start goes to town on both Davids, Davidsons. And so Which is turns, hard to do considering he's about five three and the Davidsons are about six three. Exactly, but you know what? <laughs> that place popped like it hadn't in years. Wow! And uh, you know, he and tag he, uh, he and Tall Three formed a tag team right there and then, saying, you know, we want your titles next week. We want you know we, you know, we want you in this ring. And the next week they had a match that I kid you not went 45 minutes, and like I said, Davidson... Was it a Japan-style match? Oh, God, no. This was an <laughs> Abdullah-style match. Oh. <laughs> All four guys juiced, and Talltree did the thing... Something Talltree would do is, when he juiced and got a really good flow going, he would go close to the ropes, and when guys would hit him, he'd, sw- he'd sell his head, like swing his head around, so the blood would fly, fly. out of the audience. Right. <laughs> and... uh the the crowd, you know, it was a typical San Bernardino crowd, probably only maybe 400 people there, but these people were coming unglued. And wow. then I think they went to a double DQ or something, and uh, Tall Tree and Wayne take the mic and say, you know, we want you next week in a cage, you know. And then Jeff Walton, in true Jeff Walton fashion, runs Did he have a says, contract in his pocket? <laughs> Oh, that's the only thing missing. That would have made it so perfect. But it was even better. He said, yes, fans, I want every one of you to see this match. So right now, we're selling tickets for $1. <laughs> and there were actually a few fans who ran to ringside and said, only a dollar? And Walton just goes, only $1. <laughs> and the best part was the next week in the cage uh, for the tag titles, by the way, did they call it the Freddie Blassie cage or the Chavo Guerrero cage? <laughs> <laughs> Just as long as they didn't call it the Dario Romero cage. Okay. <laughs> That's the cage that would collapse when you try to call it. Find it. <laughs> there, was, oh, there, 
was a couple that was so excited that the next week, remember the old t-shirt shops where you'd, you, if you wanted your name or a saying on a t-shirt, yeah, you you'd get, those, get them get ironed big, on with flannel those letters. Felt, those big felt letters, yeah. Sure. Yes, yes. They actually had, each couple had made t-shirts saying, Tim Tall Tree and Ken Wayne, new America's tag team champions. Wow, they actually went through the trouble of doing yes. that. Yes. Boy, that must have cost a lot of money per letter. I'll tell you that. That's, <laughs> That's really the funny This is San Bernardino. I mean, where That's did they right. get the change? Uh, hey, Kurt, I'm not confused about one thing. What did this have to do with Joe Lightfoot leaving? Oh, I guess I, I should have Joe, I guess I Joe Lightfoot said that. started. Did, did, was, well, why did Joe Lightfoot? I mean, I saw, I've seen Joe Lightfoot wrestle, and never was there a name that did not fit him. He was not light of foot. He was at not all. light at all. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Well, no, no. The reason I said it is, is he went to do the job. He he did that one last match in San Bernardino to job uh, for oh, uh, I got the it. Davidson okay. brother. Yeah, I should have filled that part in. But so so instead of instead of really doing much with that match, they just used the match kind of as an angle. And uh, so they have the, they have another great match that went nearly uh, forty five minutes in the cage. Uh, everybody except Ken Wayne juices and. Uh, since it was in the cage, of course, they come up with the spot where Tall Tree goes to nail one of the Davidsons. They throw Ken Wayne in his way. He nails Ken Wayne. And Ken Wayne turns on Tall Tree and they juice him up even more. And that couple in the front row started bawling. No. Started crying their eyes out. <laughs> oh, I'm glad you clarified that. It scared me for a second. <laughs> uh. <laughs> Yeah, no, they were bawling, literally bawling. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, and Sandra and Bernardino was never the same. In, That's in an broad, interesting reaction to it. Yeah, in broad was, daylight, even. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> hey, from what we understand, it uh, happened up in uh, uh, in Calgary uh, very frequently. Yeah, oh, hey, hey, I mean, you, hey, baby. Hey, hey, baby. Nothing. I was going to make that same joke. <laughs> I was hey baby, say, nothing gets hey. nothing gets me hotter than a good heel turn. Yeah. Uh, you know that was one of the greatest ironies uh, in Bret Hart's book is how he talked about how dim and goofy the fans in Memphis were, but he talks about Calgary as this great prideful territory. But he also said that all the retarded people were screwing in the back. Yeah, and named their children Jeez. Brett and Bruce and Smith, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which one is Brett? Is that is that the one who, who's biting his hand uh, compulsively, or, or is he the one grabbing at flies? Which one is he? Uh? <laughs> oh, you know, while we were talking earlier, I took a, a quick look under the uh, under Hillbilly Jim online, and he actually wrestled in Memphis as Harley Davidson. Harley Davidson. Yeah. Yeah, and on... he, he teamed up with Dirty Roads, and they were like a biker duo. So that's why I knew there was confusion somewhere. By the way, here's something to make you feel old. Next year, Hillbilly Jim turned 60. Oh, my God. Wow. 60? Wow. I was a baby when he started wrestling. <laughs> I don't feel that old. Do you all remember, remember when Hillbilly Jim had that first Piper's Pit interview? Before I he remember was, that. Be, before he was actually Hillbilly Jim. I mean, he he was getting ready to be renamed Hillbilly Jim. Yeah, but Roddy was, Piper asked him, what's your name, son? And he goes, Jim. Big Jim. <laughs> <laughs> and Roddy Piper was, they were, they were going to call him Big Jim. That's originally. right, Roddy Piper. Big Jim, huh? <laughs> 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 oh, that's a classic. <laughs> I remember his training videos with Hulk Hogan and A.J. Petruzzi. <laughs> Oh God! Right. Yeah, <laughs> See, I loved. I that's one of those things where again you just love that. You know, here's a guy from Mudlick, Kentucky, and he keeps showing up each week at, at ringside. At yeah, he cities. sure does love that wrestling. Yeah, yeah, it sure does. Southern Ontario and Poughkeepsie, New York. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's showing up to Poughkeepsie every week. <laughs> that's right. That? Well, in fact, his his. When he was in Memphis, he had that video that uh, wound the up Harley on Davidson Johnny Legend. Video, right? What's that? Wasn't that the Harley Davidson video? The where he was he was in a video. Yeah, he was in the video where they play that song from Two Thousand Maniacs, uh, "The South Will Rise Again." Yeah, he's riding like a motorcycle, isn't he? Yeah, he rides a motorcycle, but he's also riding these little like go karts and stuff. It's, it was a really funky video. <laughs> I remember just watching and just going, "Okay, I'm tripping here." <laughs> God bless Memphis, one of the greatest territories ever. Oh, my goodness. 
And yeah, I at least, say, at, at, least not, I love, at least not in Memphis they know how to prefab a table. I'll tell you that. Oh, no God, that. yeah. <laughs> Prayers for Jerry Lawler there, man. Oh, isn't that sad? That what is. A, who would put a 61-year-old man through an un, uh, unprefab table? That's awful to do to him. Oh. I mean, when they showed when they showed him after the commercial break, walking up the uh, ramp there, boy, he 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 wasn't playing. He was no. really hurting. He didn't look happy at all either. No, like, you no. Know, I, I, was Bret Hart anywhere in the building? He he had a lot of words for Walt Lawler in his book. <laughs> By the way, did you guys hear about the whole, uh, from the same show Monday, about the whole Hugh Jackman, Dolph Ziggler thing? I just, I only watched the Sinclair showdown. (laughs) Uh, Threw a hell of a good punch. I don't think he pulled it at all. No, Hugh Jackman, uh, they they think he might have uh, cracked, uh, legitimately cracked Dolph Ziggler's jaw. Damn. It's a work between Ziggler and Jackman. Oh, no way. Yeah, Uh, it's a work. Very oh, what? Cool. Yeah. Oh. Did you did you Jackman tell you that, Fredo? Is that what happened? Yeah, he did. He tweeted it. <laughs> <laughs> and we were having lunch together in Pomona. <laughs> in a wine <laughs> garden. Wine garden. <laughs> garden. <laughs> yes. Oh, forgive me. I boy, did I miss a good cue there. You missed a cue there. Did I way. ever? Yeah. Did I ever? You know, um, the, he did a really yeah, good. He did a really good job. You Jackman did a really good job, though. He actually looked like he was having a good time, and he knew what to do. It's better than most of the wrestlers on this. Yeah, show. I mean they talked about it, but when he, you know, he when he jumped up on the apron to punch uh, Ziggler, you know, he looked both ways. He, yeah. you know, gave the crowd a second to get built up for it, and just knew how to do it. You know, he was about a hundred times better than Bret Hart was the week before. Well, yeah, that's seriously. because you know I felt bad for Bret Hart because what they do is, you know, he's he's brought up in one uh, on one way of doing that stuff, and now they're out there saying, okay, say this, say that, change this, do that, you know. But I don't know whose idea it was to let him go out there looking like he had just come off of beach combing. Yeah, he looks old like that. When he well, what's him. yeah? I don't know why they have to wet down his hair, and make him look just uh, looks disturbing. You know, the smartest <laughs> guy in this business eventually is still going to turn out to be Shawn Michaels because he's going to be the guy that stays away. I mean, yeah, he's come in for a couple super kicks, but in general, he's the guy. You know, I, I think it was the other day I saw something. One of his tweets over the weekend that was something to the extent of, "Well, I went to church today, and now I got to plow, plow the North 40. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> and I thought, "Good for you, man. To go out no, there and just, you know, to go out no, there and I, do I that it. stuff. I mean, don't ever but, come back to wrestling. Don't do I it." I mean, you know? I love hearing the story about how Jack Briscoe, who, I mean, a legend, just decided one night, "Okay, that's it. I'm not a wrestler anymore," and never looked back. Yeah, that's a great story. Uh, I mean, that was rare. That was just, so you don't think that you don't think Triple H is asking him, you know, just uh, just come back for a month for, I bet for a you couple anything months. they're asking him. I bet you they want him badly, and if he's smart, he'll stick to his guns. I bet he will. I don't think he's. I don't think he's a guy that will come back for one more match. And I for and I actually believe as much as they talk about. It, I don't think Steve Austin ever will either. No, no I don't I, think he will I, either. Yeah, and, not an actual match. No, I think he might. I think he might do the one no. match with Punk or something. I think he would do it with Punk if he could, but I know that he really worries about the fact of how he will look, that he can't do some of the stuff that he used to do. Yeah, you know, he's too so. concerned with his with, sometimes, with that reputation. You know, you know, sometimes ego works both ways. Either the ego makes you go out there and, and you know, like Flair and Hogan and, and work when you shouldn't be working, or ego says to you, I can't go out there because uh, if I'm not I do. as good as Jay used to be. Yeah. I don't know. But I think Austin Peak, though, as a draw and everything, was when he was taking the least bumps and stuff. So, well, I mean, he might. And I'm not. I'm not to say to rule it out that it wouldn't be a good match or whatever. But you know, I sometimes to to quote the the great cliche song. I think sometimes we should leave the memories alone. No, I agree. I agree. I mean, I, I mean, think we'll see Bob Backlund before we see Stone Cold Steve Austin in a WWE ring. Well, Bob Backlund, if he did the same thing he used to do, he wouldn't. It wouldn't be that much of a stretch for him. I mean, it wasn't like you know, it wasn't That's like the guy true. was Sin Cara or anything, you know. Yeah. I just, I've always, or I've always had this Eight weird feeling stars. that Backlund's going to come back for one strange sort of run. He's probably still in pretty good shape for his age. Yeah, he probably is. I mean, you know, he would uh, he would do that. So uh, here's my thing: Why can't we just have four or five Sin Caras? 
Um, <laughs> like you never know what one, could happen. A black one, a fat one, a female one. I mean, let's a just Teddy Hart one. Do yeah, let's just do different <laughs> Sin Caras. So, yeah. Boy, don't give Vince any ideas. <laughs> <laughs> God damn it, that's a great idea. 15 now, Sin Caras. Now, so, I'll do a I, spin-off show. Wanted, and it'll all be Sin Cara. That's we'll have a battle royal. Now, <laughs> something I wanted to insert when we hit on Memphis just a few minutes ago, just really briefly, I have read the Gary Hart book. I loved it up and down. What oh, a great okay. book. Here we go. Wow. Beautiful. I mean, just excellent. Yeah. There were a few things that I thought were eh, but the one that had me doubled over laughing is when, you know, he portrayed Jerry Jarrett as the biggest loser in the world. <laughs> However, there was another great promoter and wonderful person and a gentleman there named Nick Goulas. <laughs> he put over Nick Goulas. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he yeah, kinda he, like, I, it wasn't exactly like that. It's more like, well, I never did business with Nick Goulas, and, you know, I've heard the stories, but he certainly was an entertaining guy. Um, after you read that, because because he gave he gave I I got the impression when I read that he he was like you know a great promoter. I mean, okay. (laughs) (laughs) Well, no, I I I I, I gotta have to side with Bix on this one. My feeling was that he basically. Oh, great, Dan! Thanks for fighting with Bix. (laughs) (laughs) No, no, I'm saying was that I think that what he did was he basically he's saying was look, I know the guy was an asshole to a lot of people, but he did screw with me, and I think that's what he was saying. Basically, okay. But, and but, also, as far as like the Tennessee promoters went, I think his thing was more, yeah, Nico Goulas gave guys low payoffs. Yeah. But the but the Welch is really, you know, disrespected yeah. them. But boy, boy, oh boy, Jerry Hart did not like Jerry Jarrett. Oh no. Yeah, I'm ad- I'm, man, that, yeah, that's I, some, that's some deep wounds there. Wow. I know. I'd love to know. I'd love to know other people's perspective who were involved because. Yeah. I. I mean. Yeah. I. I don't I'm know. I love that, that book. Yet, it's but I'm easily in the, one of my three favorite books I've ever read in the biz. But there are some instances where I say I would love to hear other people's perspective who were involved and. Um, you know, yeah. The, oh, I know. I. You mean I got, like asking how, how much other main eventers were making in uh, Georgia for work for a weekend. Stuff like that, or more like the Paul. Well, Bach more like when or, when he had you know the various you know sound you know I mean sounds like a guy who really stuck to his guns you know a lot of things to respect about him but you know when he bagged on people sometimes I'd like to know what was their take on it. Well, uh, the only I, problem you run into there is being professional wrestling. You know, yeah. you know, how do you know a professional wrestler is lying? His lips are moving. I mean, yeah. Yeah. that's the problem is that, it, you know, it, it, it becomes that. It, it just gets that way. I mean, and the thing is, it, it's so such a weird business because, you know, you can, you know, two guys can get mad at each other over, you know, a $5 payoff and never speak to each other their entire life. And two other guys, you know, uh, one guy could have killed the other guy's sister, and yet they'll do business together. No, you know, that's true. Just, that's very true. Just weird no, that and, and that's why that's why you know not that everybody who writes a book who is removed from the business or has never been in the business, not everyone is good. The ones that are good are the ones I find most intriguing because they're the ones who generally are going to try to, you know, how do you say, look at it from out of the box, where no matter how intelligently or how spun a wrestler or manager's uh, memoirs are. You're always wondering, like you said, their lips are moving. So, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, you're always gonna you're you're always going to find that, and especially with something like wrestling, where yeah, you know, stories. You know, and let's just face it. Also, uh, you know, it, there were many years removed by the time that Gary Hart had to remember that story. It's and, amazing how much he remembered. I mean, well, in that detail, was that amazing. was impressive. And I tell you, the the book was worth it just for that chapter on the on the um, on the airline on the airplane crash. Yeah. And that's the other thing. Talk about a guy who endured more than his share of tragedy and two plane and, crashes. Yeah, yeah. That's why I, use, I love that story when he talked about how Cornette didn't mind flying with with him because he said the guy's been in two of them and lived. So I feel. Well, no, 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 no. That wasn't it. It was that Cornette didn't didn't know he was in two plane crashes, but Cornette would feel safe when Gary Hart or or David Crockett or Ric Flair yeah, right. was on the plane because he's like. 
oh, what's the likelihood that anyone anyone would be in two plane crashes in their lives, not knowing mm-hmm. the carry had been in two? Yeah, exactly. Huh. Yeah, but no, I, I recommend I recommend the book. Yeah, if you can get the book, it's, it's just amazing can, work. Yeah, if yeah. if you can get the book, get it now because who knows when it'll go off the market again? Yeah, because right? I think and, they're still selling it. But yeah, I mean, I know yeah. when uh, when yeah when Jason Hart was on. Um, did the interview with Jason Powell a few weeks ago. I think he said it's another pretty small printing. Yeah, exactly. And the thing is, it, it's, yeah, I think it's like, it's. Th- I think it was 30 bucks. Isn't it 30 or 35? Is it's it? 30 plus shipping. It's like 30 plus shipping. But, but the fact of the matter is, it's it's worth its weight in gold. And yeah. as we were talking before, when that when the book first disappeared the first time, that thing was, was going, was being, was being put up on eBay for 400 bucks. Wow. Man, as much as I love the biz, I can't think of anything I'd pay four hundred bucks for. <laughs> yeah, I know. But no, it is it is it is a, a great piece of work. I, you know, I, you, I, I forgot just how many territories he is so heavily involved in. And yeah, I mean, it really is a history. I mean, yeah. you start out in Chicago in the fifties, and you move through all these, and he was one of those guys that was lucky enough to be in most of the territories. Uh, when they were really hot, whether it's Florida or the uh, the world class stuff, and, uh, and he never know, did make it out here, did he? No, he never did. And he talked about a couple of times. I found interesting how he was either supposed to, or they wanted him to go to the WWF, and because of an altercation he had with Bruno years ago, uh, he never wound up going there. And then later, when Bruno was was gone, uh, there were other things that that stood in the way. I forgot exactly what it was, but a lot of stuff. It was um that right it was something like Jay Strongbow, yes, did something to sort of screw up his tryout, and when he found out it because Jay he had fired Jay Strongbow because Jay Strongbow and some other guys did this whole thing to yeah it was the old I, I, that's right I think it was it was the old he was told to show up at a certain time and he and right, not to like, show up and he didn't have to and all that kind of stuff like that. So. Huh. Right, and when he found out that Jay Strongbow was one of the agents and had yeah. you know decent amount of power in the company, that he knew there was no way he could you know that he would come in that he could come yeah. in. I, I mean, really though, the big thing for me is that if there is so much stuff about Texas wrestling history in there, especially. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and talk about talk about enduring tragedy. I mean, uh, you know, being like family with the Von Erich kids, and uh, just just a slew of other people who had you know, you know, a lot of unfortunate happenings in the business that he. Kurt, was why don't you to. take your copy of the book to Wrestle Reunion next year, and you can get Kevin Von Erich to sign it. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin, oh, I didn't even think you wrote it. Does that book put put Fritz in a bad light? Especially Boy, did he, it ever. Kevin Von Erich is going to be in Wrestle Reunion? Yes, yeah. he is. Well, no way, really. Yes, he's going to be. Uh, at, uh, he will. He. I think they added him and Molly Holly and um, Big so El Negro. Uh, El Negro will be there. El, no, El Negro is going to be a VIP guest. That's right, and he'll and, be and along with. Basically, you pay forty dollars, and he will job to you in the ring. That's along that. with uh, John Davidson, and uh, <laughs> uh, we're going to get uh, some psychics and parapsychologists and try to channel Chino Cho <laughs> so he can appear. Is Chino Cho dead? Yeah, he passed away. I want to say seven or eight years ago. I said, did, did you mention that once before? Didn't what? What did he die from? That I don't know. I just remember it mentioned he passed away. Probably and, from tagging with Gene LaBelle. That's probably what. <laughs> Quit I'm yelling so in my old. ear! Quit yelling in my ear! <laughs> you know, I'm a little disappointed that Wrestle Reunion doesn't have any L.A. you know wrestlers. Oh, but Ryan, how many are left? Yeah, I know. But you know, I have Kevin Von Erich still around. And how many? And how many people are as old as we are to know these guys? Yeah, <laughs> yeah I would point. believe me. I would be thrilled to see Billy Rogers, Mickey Doyle, well, or John Burrage, you know, but I think I'd be only one. You know, one of the few. Well, it's the same thing. You know, when I when you know. Here, here. Uh, part of me will I drop a dead name. When I was at John Tolos's funeral, uh, I spent a lot of time talking to to Billy Rogers, and uh, my God, that guy was interesting. You know, I would have stayed and talked to him longer, but it felt weird talking to him in the middle of a graveyard. Uh, yeah. But he remember, you know, he was very happy that you know that I had remembered him fondly and about some stuff, and 
uh, I said it was weird because it was me, Billy Rogers, and Richard Dawson's son. Mm-hmm. And the three of us were talking just about stuff, and he was the nicest guy. Uh, and again, that's one of those things where, but think about it, he's one of the last guys left. Yeah, he is. I know John John Birch is still alive. He yeah, Rick Drazen retired. Rick I'd love Morris. to meet him. He was a really really friendly guy, really in good shape, even well into his fifties. Well, what about, I think, what about Al Madrill? Ooh, where <laughs> is he? And can we get him to confess that he once was a wrestler? As soon as he comes back from his honeymoon with Dark Journey, he's going to come on the show. <laughs> I told you that. <laughs> He's going to be on this show. He and Mrs. Uh, and, and Mrs. Almadrill. No, that that's so ridiculous. Don't you know he's trying to spring Evelyn Stevenson to prison and marry her? <laughs> that's a great part of the book. Evelyn Stevenson, God, yeah. Yeah, it's I didn't funny know about that. I had no idea. I that didn't either. She had killed a, her, anyone. Much and by sure coincidence, right. just a few months before reading the book, I'm saying, oh, I remember her. Whatever happened to her? Boy, do... <laughs> Boy, was I surprised! <laughs> well, either you know, you figure you had to figure either she she killed someone or she was was wrestling naked for Mildred Burke on those eight yeah eight exactly yeah films that were being done at that time. <laughs> that was the weirdest thing, you know. Uh, I always used to see in the back of those magazines that that Mildred Burke, you know, uh, you know, you could buy you know eight millimeter films and stuff like that. And yep. it wasn't until you sent me that one, Kurt. All of a sudden, it's like it was just, was just really weird. It was uh, the I think the one I sent you was Cheryl Day versus Sandy Sandy Partlow, who was a Journey woman for yeah, a number of years. I, I, I remember. And they I were remember. wrestling. They were wrestling stark naked in uh, Mildred Burke's ring. Out here in Canoga Park, where I yeah. live. Yeah. I mean, by the way, did you, did you, you got any of you guys read that? Read the Mildred Burke book. Yeah, I uh, love Jeff that book. Did. In fact, Kurt spent some time. Did, didn't you talk to the author for a while, Kurt? Yeah, Jeff Lean. I I talked to him at Cauliflower Alley Club. Uh, he, he just had a badge that said Jeff, and uh, we were talking uh, for a good fifty minutes till we realized that we actually corresponded with each other. Uh, you know, I, I'd say the Mildred Burke book and the Gorgeous George book are two of my favorite books on the business ever. I, Kurt, you know what we should do, really and truly? We should see if we can get both these guys to come on the show. Not together, because that would be even worse than the yeah. right now. But, uh, <laughs> but With all of us on, to on to the people on Talk Show Live. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then, because I also know I'm very excited, because I know that October 1st, the Memphis Heat uh, documentary comes out on DVD. I so want to see that. Yeah, I really, I really want to see it. That's for Spundick Monroe. Yeah, Just oh, Sputnik is one. There's one guy I wish I would have met. I w- uh, he's another one I'd love to channel into the LA. Because he tells he tells these stories, and you know that he's just full of shit. But I I want them to be true. I want to believe a, a woman in Plano, Texas, threw her infant child at him. <laughs> <laughs> well, I so badly want I, that to be I, true. That's one of the things I loved about Dr. Jerry Graham, and the thing it was almost like uh, like. Uh, it could have been a game show trying to figure out which Dr. Jerry Graham stories are true and which weren't because he would tell these way out stories that you're saying, yeah, right, Doc. And then you'd find out they were true. But then he'd tell a story that sounded reasonable and not very braggadocious, and you'd find out he made it up. And I... It's fascinating the way wrestlers' imaginations work when they spin yarns. You know, because I was so disappointed to find out that that Andre the Giant story about him waiting to sign uh, people waiting to, little kids waiting to sign get autographs from Andre and then he came bursting out of the dressing room naked looking for prostitutes yeah waiting his true. penis <laughs> yeah and that was I, I should have, I I should have known that. that the story was fake be uh, because of the original source yes exactly Diamond That's Timothy that. Flowers who has one of the most fertile imaginations in professional wrestling but I so wanted that to be true I wanted that it been to be true story. I was so disappointed when I heard it wasn't because I remember uh, asking Jeff Walton about it and he says uh, no Je- no, Andre was just uh, wouldn't come out of his hotel room and didn't want to wrestle that's all there was to it <laughs> by the way I, I want to say we talk about Jeff Walton uh, if, if this gets out to him somehow through his son Scott I did I did attend a birthday party a couple of weeks ago that Scott was at, uh, and uh, and I said to him, I said, you know, if they ever make a movie involving a Los Angeles wrestling, Scott could play Jeff. He could. Oh, yeah. So easily. He could. But uh, I, I went to the party, and uh, he was mentioning to me that his father 
had retired from his day job after all these years. Oh, really? That's right. And I say congratulations and, and you know, Jeff, and enjoy, enjoy any rest that you can possibly get because you deserve it. Absolutely. And Jeff, please come to some of the MPW shows because we miss you. You're an awesome guy. I uh, love Jeff. Great. Guy. He is a very, very nice guy. You know, that's so much, just hearing like, you talk about it, how great Jeff Alden and just remind me of how, like, when I got some early observers, just how much Dave Meltzer just had this visceral hatred for him based on his announcing. For Jeff, well, he liked Jeff Walton quite a bit. He knows Jeff Walton. Yeah, well, I mean, he's, he's, he's had just, Jeff on the like show, but then, <laughs> but Jeff had Jeff had a very a, a very big style of announcing, and I think I can see where yeah I can I can see I think I know what you're referring to, Bix, on that one. Uh, but uh, you know Jeff's style of announcing was very big and very broad, uh, and I think probably after it's one of those things where after listening to Dick Lane all those years, that was a hard that was a hard seat to fill. Yeah, to be honest, L.A. wrestling honestly was never the same after Dick Lane yeah. left the and, announcing podium. And for and for English, the English announcers were mostly, uh, you know, Gene LaBelle and Dick. Um, uh, the Spanish announcers were were amazing. Uh, they were Luis, great. Luis, Miguel Alonso and Louis Magana. Miguel Magana. Alonso and Louis Magana were and Louis Mag- and uh, you know they were they were absolutely amazing. Even if you didn't speak Spanish, they were the guys to listen to. Right. <laughs> Yeah. In fact, I remember when John Tolis turned heel on Victor Rivera in 1973. Uh, the next Wednesday night on the Spanish show, when they're doing the locker room interviews, uh, Louis Magana, you know, who always totally played the straight person, and <clears throat> you know, when John Tolis, uh, you know, walked out, you know, a few days after turning on Victor Rivera, Louis Magana just looked at him and says, says, Mr. Tolis, like, uh, you know, I found your action so offensive, I'm not going to interview you. And he just shoves the match, uh, the microphone into Tolis' hands. And I, and being a little kid, I just thought, whoa, he never <laughs> acts like that. And it was so Kurt, underplayed, so serious, you know. Kurt, Kurt or Ryan, and I won't ask Fredo, because I know Fredo will claim that, you know, Fredo claims he was born in 1997. Uh, <laughs> but... Um, do you remember the the angle with Crusher Verdu where Crusher Verdu won a I think it was against Chavo Guerrero and because of that all the announcers were fired? Yes, and oh. all the people who knock Crusher Verdu forget what a fucking great job he did. I as the love announcer. Crusher Verdu. And I remember they came on the next week and the the graphics said Crusher Verdu presents Olympic wrestling. <laughs> you know, all that. And they did that and then but I still think he was a tough guy. He I like it. You know, I know so many tough. people who weren't keen on Crusher Verdue. I dug him. I thought he had a great look to him. He had this little, this little pug nosed bulldog look to him. Yeah. And again, I remember being in San Bernardino, watching him against uh, Mister America at uh, that time, and he was outside the ring. And this, you know, the San Bernardino arena, as you guys know, you were literally, you know, you were sitting in the front row, but you could take your hand, stretch it out, and touch the apron. Right. You know, you were that close, and somebody got mad. Uh, at him, and this guy jumped up and he punched Crusher Verdue right square in the face. And Crusher Verdue stood there and never moved and just looked at him. And Whoa. luckily for him, the cops grabbed the guy at that I was going to say, away <laughs> a stare because, from Verdue I think would be scarier than being hit by he Verdue. Hit him, <laughs> he hit him so hard it sounded like a rifle shot. And, yeah. everybody went, and it was like, everybody stopped. And it was like, <gasps> And then all of a sudden, it, it was he just stood there for a second, like I can't believe he just did that. And wow. I swear to God, he the only thing that saved that guy's life was the fact that there were there were two cops, one Hispanic and and one uh, white, who were the uh, the security guys. And they were the same guys there all the years I went there. And they both came down and grabbed him in a, like a Signal Hill headlock or whatever and drug him off. And uh, saying, "We're saving your life, kid." <laughs> they were saying, "We're saving your life, kid." He probably did the old days. They probably took him and threw him in the dressing room and let him <laughs> yeah, let the guys <laughs> have a little fun with him. Yeah, I, I'll never forget Verdu when he did the heel announcing. Uh, you know, there was, you know, you know, at the beginning of the show, you know, they would go to the announcers' booth and they would, you know, introduce what's coming. You know, they you know they had one of those segues in the middle, and Verdu was just uh, instead of talking about the wrestlers you were going to see tonight, he's saying, "I was the America's champion, the America's tag team champion, and now you know, I'm the most accomplished announcer in Los Angeles, and I don't know what to say, but I'm so proud of myself." 
Well, he, I, was, he was he was okay. really cool. Well, he was a good. Ta- he also had, was was a really good tag team with Fabulous Frank Monty. Do you remember That's that? That's right. Him? And Fabulous Frank Monty was the stretcher king. He he did the old gimmick of bringing the stretcher into the ring. And they were. Ta- I think they were, they may have been had a, even a short run as America Tags champ. Uh, before they went, and they they turned Monty, which was a big mistake because it just never worked after that. He didn't, and uh, I, I but, thought he was an underrated heel. Yeah, and they were and they were really good together. You could, and there, there are two guys that you wouldn't think would have been, but they were they worked really well. But uh, yeah, Crusher Verdu was I think was always very underrated. I mean, just from the look and who he was, he was not the biggest, tallest guy in the world. No. But he, he's one of those guys you look at him and you go, ah, I wouldn't screw with him. Yeah, I wouldn't. Miss- oh, did any did anybody see the night he broke Jeff Walton's glasses? Yes. Yeah, I remember, well, I remember hearing about that. Oh, I remember, because it was when he was the heel announcer and he comes it comes out when Walton's doing the interviews and saying, Walton, haven't I told you I don't like the way you look with glasses? And Walton, is, it was Walton in, in true character is like, but Mr. Verdu, I really can't see very well without my glasses. <laughs> and so Verdu just takes him off his face, sets him on the ground, and steps on each lens as one at a time. Wow. Yeah, I just remember Bull Ramos cutting Jeff Walton's tie. Oh, I never saw that. Poor Jeff was fodder for all the all the heel maneuvers. And then what was really sad was uh, the next they had a match and they had another interview and Jeff Walton kept the chopped tie on. Oh, that's awesome! And Chavo, Chavo Guerrero comes on to the to do the locker room interview, and Chavo goes and grabs the tie and starts laughing. What? And I thought that was so kind of like not cool, you know? Oh my lord! He starts laughing. I thought, well, that's not nice. And you heard a voice in the background screaming, "Kayfabe, kayfabe, kayfabe." <laughs> Hey Ryan, I meant to ask you when you posted that picture of of the uh, Guerrero brothers with you and the Guerrero brothers from the yeah. first WrestleMania reunion. I'm standing in the background waving, <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and, and Chavo saw the picture and responded to it. Did he call us fat? Uh, he, called, called he, called, he called me Gordo. <laughs> How dare he? Because <laughs> that was a great picture. Because I remember you were posing for it. I was standing there. I just like started like waving like Eugene at you. Whatever. <laughs> was. Well, I think you you really made the picture that expression of that wave. Yeah. You know? <laughs> but no, he called me Gordo. And that's fine. You know. What am I gonna What am I gonna say? No. You know. I'm thin as a rail. Oh, because Chava will hurt you. That's right. That's right. <laughs> I'm just this gentleman you. is nearing the top of the hour, and uh, uh, as always on a Thursday night, what does Vandal Drummond have to do? Impact he wrestling to, in a few minutes. He oh, no, to some, do something much more enjoyable than that. He has to do his impression <laughs> of Chino Cho. That's right. And Chino Cho, good evening, old Potato City. And by the way, I'm not related to El Farone at all. Oh. The guy El Farone, remember, remember <laughs> yeah, the guy from the yeah. El Farone? So we have to come up with a new luchador named El Farron. Yeah, exactly. yeah, El Shoot Fighter. So thank you, all you cats, Fredo Esparza. Uh, heads up, people! Fredo and I will be doing an, another Lucha World uh, podcast in the next few days. Yeah, try to Ryan, get up for this one, will you? What's that? Try to wake up for this one. I know. will. I'm going to be armed with, with caffeine this time. Just be yourself, Kurt. Don't be. Don't try to pull it in and be serious. It you are okay. Hard. I will do that. I will do that. As you once dubbed me, I am El Hombre de Café. So that's right. <laughs> I'll amp it up some. <laughs> and Brian Doyle, as always, thank you, you for just coming said up. Brian with... Doyle. What? You just told him. <laughs> Brian. Yeah, it just sounded like you threw a B in front of it. Oh, did I? I didn't <laughs> intend to. <laughs> okay, let me try that again. Okay, Brian Doyle. <laughs> <laughs> Always coming up with some great uh, old school subjects that oh, just get our, our imagination exercising. Fredo, the silent man back there, who, who we'll hear more from on the Lucha World podcast. And Bixie Demon, I am so glad you made it tonight. We were. Are you feeling we were... better now, Bix? Yeah, I think I just. Very cool. An act. We'll be back. I think I'm falling back asleep. <laughs> then have wonderful, wonderful dreams, and and be certain to rejoin us in two weeks. Two weeks we shall return, folks. And remember, until then, may you kiss the heart so that the. <sighs> <laughs> Hello. What happened? Hello. Was yeah. that it? Did Kurt I just kiss the heart. Kid? I'm nodding off. 
Okay, well, <laughs> No, no, may we yeah, all we're still here. kiss the heart. May everybody kiss the heart. So the right hemisphere of the brain will short-circuit the left hemisphere. The left hemisphere will short-circuit the right hemisphere. And bing! Bing! You're there. Wow!